Good morning. It is good to see each one here. We are a little warm in our weather. Glad that we're all able to be out in this place and be with one another as we worship our God. This morning, I wanted to go back to the Psalms, and in particular, Psalm 106. Psalm 106 was probably written by David. The first and last two verses that are found in the sacred song David delivered to Asaph when he brought up the Ark of the Lord are in these verses, or in this psalm, I should say, the first and last two verses. Between the first and last two verses of this psalm, though, we find the mournful details of the sins of Israel and the extraordinary patience of God. This psalm is a national confession of sin. The sins of the people are all listed here. The first section of this psalm deals with the history of the people of Israel from Egypt and in the wilderness, as we've seen in our Bible study on Sunday mornings. Section 1, sins are committed in Egypt and at the Red Sea. We saw the unbelief of the children of Israel there. We saw their sins while they were lusting in the wilderness, verses 13, 14, and 15. There's the envying of Moses and Aaron and the positions they held that God had appointed them to. There's the worship of the golden calf while they were at Mount Sinai and the people giving themselves back over to idolatry. There was the despising of the promised land where the people refused to go into the land and take it because of the negative report of ten of the spies who were sent in to spy out the land. There's the iniquity of Baal of Peor, who was thought he was going to curse the children of Israel, but ended up blessing them. There's their sins at the waters of Meribah, where they complained against Moses and against God that you've brought us out in this wilderness to die. The sin of Moses there, where he failed to sanctify God in the eyes of the people. Then continuing that same sad story, the psalmist then turned to the unfaithfulness of the people while they were in the land. That's section two of the psalm. And as you look to it, you see failure when they were settling in Canaan. Compassion from God when they were brought low by all that was happening to them. And their plea to God for mercy as they were demonstrating unbelief after they had gotten into the land. But this entire psalm can be summarized by the description of what happened immediately after the children of Israel crossed the Red Sea. That's found in verses 12 through 15 of this psalm. It says of them, Then they believed his words, the words of God. They sang his praise. They soon forgot his works, did not wait for his counsel, but lusted exceedingly in the wilderness and tested God in the desert. And he gave them their request but sent leanness into their soul. It is the last portion of these verses that we want to focus our attention on this morning, that God gave them their request, gave them what they asked for, but then it says he sent leanness into their soul. Well, what does that mean? It means that just because God gives you the desire of your soul is no proof that you are the object of divine favor. God has given people over the millennia what they asked for, but they ended up paying the price for it. Have you ever heard the warning, be careful what you ask for, you might just get it? That's in relation to God too. God will grant many times those things that people request, those things they desire, but they will end up paying a price for it. So we want to talk this morning about the phrase leanness of soul and see exactly what it means and how it can affect us. And we'll begin that by looking at some examples from Scripture where people made requests of God or made requests of others and then paid the penalty for it. We start by citing Jacob. Jacob wanted the blessing that belonged to his brother. That's what Jacob asked for. That's what Jacob desired. Well, he got what he wanted. He got what he wanted by way of deception. 
His father said to him, your brother came with deceit. He said to Esau, I should say, your brother came with deceit and has taken away your blessing. Therefore, Jacob had won his way by deceit. But it's interesting. When you look to what we see about Jacob the rest of his life, Jacob spent the rest of his life being deceived by others. His father-in-law, Laban, deceived him in a number of ways. He deceived him about Rachel and Leah. He deceived him about the wages that he would pay him. Jacob agreed to work for Laban to have the hand of Rachel in marriage. And he worked seven years in order to be able to be with her. In Genesis 29, verse 25, it came to pass in the morning that, behold, it was Leah. Jacob had spent the night, he thought, with his new wife, Rachel, but it had been Leah who was in the tent with him. So he said to Laban, what is this you have done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served you? Why have you deceived me? Jacob, the deceiver, became one who was deceived. And because of that, we see he spent the rest of his life being deceived. His wages, Genesis 31 and verse 7, he says to his wives, Your father has deceived me and changed my wages ten times. But God did not allow him to hurt me. So under the time that he lived with Laban, and had Leah and Rachel as his wives, he had been deceived by their father. But not only that, his sons deceived him about the death of Joseph. In Genesis 37, beginning in verse 29, Reuben, who was the oldest son of Jacob, returned to the pit in which they had placed Joseph. And indeed, Joseph was not in the pit. Remember, his brothers were upset with him. At first, they wanted to kill him. But Reuben had stopped them and said, just cast him into the pit. And he tore his clothes, thinking that they had taken his brother and killed him. And he returned to his brothers and said, the lad is no more, and I, where shall I go? So they took Joseph's tunic, killed a kid of the goats, dipped the tunic in blood. Then they sent the tunic of many colors, and they brought it to their father and said, we have found this. Do you know whether it is your son's tunic or not? And he recognized it and said, It is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Without doubt, Joseph is torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth on his waist, mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and all his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, For I shall go down into the grave to my son in mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Now Joseph wasn't dead. The Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and a captain of the guard. But his own children, his own sons deceived Jacob. Jacob, as we said, spent his entire life being deceived. And as Jacob is ready to pass him this life, he mourns his own life and he reflects upon it. Consider that reflection that we see in Genesis 47 and verse 9. Jacob said to Pharaoh, the days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life. And they have not attained to the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. My life does not measure up to my fathers or my grandfathers is what he's saying. My life is not greatness and does not speak of greatness like Abraham's life spoke of him, like Isaac's life spoke of him. But Jacob had started deceiving people. And he ended up being deceived. He got what he wanted. But he surely paid the price. Then our second example is the children of Israel in wanting a king. <clears throat> in 1 Samuel, the 8th chapter, and in verse 6, Israel said to God, Give us a king to judge us. Now, Samuel was ruling over them at the time, not as a king, but as a judge. Samuel was 
an extraordinary man, a very good man. But they wanted a king so that they could be like the nations round about them. They wanted a physical king who would lead them out into battle, who they could see, and give them strength as he was going before them. But God said to Samuel, they haven't rejected you. They've rejected me as their king. Remember that Israel back at that time was a theocracy. Theo, God. <laughs> it was a government that was ruled by God. God had given them the law through Moses and they were to live by those laws. And that should have been sufficient for them. But it was not. That's not what they wanted. They wanted to be like the nations round about them. They wanted to have a king, a physical king, so they could boast about it. Well, Samuel tried to stop them. He explained the behavior of kings to them. But in spite of the warnings, the people persisted. God gave them a king. God gave them what they wanted. In 1 Samuel 8, chapter verse 11. And he said, this will be the behavior of the king who reigned over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for his own chariots and to be his horsemen. Some will run before his chariots. He will appoint captains over his thousands and captains over his fifties. Will set some to plow his ground, to reap his harvest, and some to make his weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers, cooks, and bakers. And he will take the best of your fields, your vineyards, your olive groves, and give them to his servants. He will take a tenth of your grain and your vintage and give it to his officers and servants. Remember, they were already paying a tithe, a tenth. And now he was going to double that. He will take your male servants, your female servants, your finest young men, your donkeys, and put them to his work. He will take a tenth of your sheep. You will be his servants. And you will cry out in that day because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves. And the Lord will not hear you in that day. The Lord had heard their cry for a king, so he gave them what they wanted, but they paid the price for it. In 1 Samuel 8, continuing verse 19, Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, No, but we will have a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Now we've studied in our Sunday morning Bible class, that God was going to go out before the people as they entered into a land and fight all their battles. They won their battles not because they were superior militarily, but because God was with them and God was fighting their battles for them. And if they would have remained believers in God, trusted in God, and allowed God to rule over them, the same would have been true for the people now. But they didn't want that. They wanted what they wanted, and God gave it to them. But they lived to regret it. For Saul, indeed, their first king, turned out to be like the kings of the nations around them. He turned out to be wicked. He turned out to be selfish. He turned out to be the one who was not looking after the people, but looking after himself. He turned out to be one who rejected God and the commandments of God. God ultimately rejected him. The people paid the price for wanting a king. Well, God gave them a king, but they suffered because of it. Our third example is Abram's nephew, Lot. Lot wanted the best fields for his livestock. The flocks and herds of Abraham and Lot were so great that even though they'd been living in the same place, they could no longer live together. Abraham saw that was the case, that they would have to go their separate ways. But Abraham was gracious, generous, and he gave Lot first choice as to where he would go. Well, Lot saw the luscious pasture in the Jordan Valley that it would be best for his livestock to be there. And so that is what he chose. But in choosing the Jordan Valley, 
We're told he pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. And even though he was a righteous man, the environment had a corrupting influence on his family. Lot got what he wanted. But it didn't turn out the way he thought. The Apostle Peter writes of this in 2 Peter 2, verses 7 and 8. It says, Delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. He had a fitful life in Sodom. It's not only the fact that there were dire consequences at the end of the time that he was living in Sodom and that Sodom would be destroyed. For from day to day, he was tormented in his soul. There was no pleasure. There was no profit to him. It was all a miserable existence. But not only that, as a consequence of his desire, his daughters married men of Sodom, and as near as we can tell, some of them remained in Sodom when it was being destroyed because their husbands were there, and they didn't want to leave their husbands. As a consequence of his desire in the face of destruction, even Lot lingered till the angel had to encourage him to leave and to go, or he would be destroyed. And as a consequence of his desire, he lost his wife as the result of the choice he made. Lot suffered greatly because of his choice. Oh, he got what he wanted, but it didn't turn out the way he thought it would. Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, is another example. <clears throat> Naaman, the captain of the Syrian army, came to Elisha to be cleansed of his leprosy. Having heard from the young servant girl in his own nation that that prophet could heal him of his leprosy. So, Gehe so Naaman made the trip. Of course, you know, at first he became angry at what Elisha told him to do. Go dip seven times in the Jordan River. But one of his servants, using common sense, said, Master, if he had told you to do something great, wouldn't you have done it? Why don't you just go do what he said? And when he did obey the command that Elisha had given him, he rose up out of the water after plunging that seventh time, and his leprosy was gone. His skin was of that of a newborn babe. So he went back to Elisha, and he wanted to tell Elisha how grateful he was he had brought with him several changes of garments, silver and gold. And he wanted to bestow them upon Elisha, but Elisha refused. He was just doing the will of God. But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, he wanted the silver. And he wanted the garments that belonged to Naaman the leper. And he pursued Naaman. And guess what? He got what he wanted. But he also got more than he bargained for. For he too was stricken with leprosy. In 2 Kings, the fifth chapter, verse 25, speaking of Gehazi, he went in and stood before his master. Elisha said to him, Where did you go, Gehazi? Then he said to him, Did not my heart go with you when the man turned back from his chariot to meet you? Is it time to receive money and to receive clothing, olive groves and vineyards, sheep and oxen, male and female servants? Therefore the leprosy of Naaman shall cling to you and your descendants forever. And he went out from his presence leprous, as white as snow. Not much of a trade-off, is it? Oh, he wanted those garments. And garments were a sign of wealth back at that time. He wanted that silver. Those were his desires. And he was granted those things. Naaman freely gave them to him. Even though he lied to Naaman about what he was going to do with them. But when he came back, he had to pay the penalty. And he became leprous. 
and his descendants became lepers. Be careful what you ask for, what you desire. Then there's, in the New Testament, the Jewish leaders. The Jewish leaders wanted the death of Jesus Christ. They said, His blood be upon us and on our children in Matthew 27, verse 25. They were willing to put Jesus to death. And in this phrase, hold themselves and their children accountable for it. Well, they got what they wanted. Jesus died. But before he died, he had told them, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I long to gather you unto me as a mother hen gathers her chicks. But you would not. Your house is left unto you desolate. With the death of Jesus, there was nothing more that could be done for the Jews. They had rejected the only hope that they had. They rejected the Son of God. They got what they wanted. They put Jesus to death. But the city of Jerusalem was destroyed and over one million people died because God used the Romans as his instrument to bring judgment against them because of their rejection of Jesus and the fact that they put him to death. So what can we learn from all of these examples? I made the statement before, I'll make it again. Be careful what you ask for. Sometimes we allow our wants and desires to override our common sense, but even more so, our obedience unto God. As most of you know, we spent a number of years in Tallahassee, Florida, working with the church there. There are two universities there, Florida State, Florida A&M. And because of that, for many years, we had a number of college students come and be a part of our assemblies, part of our membership, some of them. And they were good kids. Their parents would often come and check on them to see if they're coming to services. And that was good. But when it came time for them to get their degree and to graduate, in that year, job offers were coming in. And when you asked nearly every one of them what they'd like to have, what their desire was, it goes without saying, I want a good paying job. Okay. And I would ask them, what are you willing to sacrifice for it? I know it requires some good things. It requires honorable and worthy things such as education, training, a commitment to continue your education, to get your degree so that you might do well in that job and have a higher pay. However, what if it requires you to forsake assembling on a regular basis? How are you going to handle that? There's some jobs that shifts work 24-7. Even executives work 24-7. All week long. What comes first? Oh, you desire a high-paying job. What are you willing to pay for it? What if you have to move to a place where no sound congregations exist? And I've seen that happen. A number of times. And guess what happened? There was a falling away. Be careful what you ask for. The Apostle Paul long ago said, Godliness with contentment is great gain. We may not be the richest people in the world, but we are the people of God, and we are blessed with spiritual riches beyond belief. We, as we said in Bible class, have all spiritual blessings in Christ Jesus. God has blessed us all abundantly. Where's your real treasure? In the Sermon on the Mount, 
Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 19, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Another desire that many people who call themselves Christians have is to have approval of their fellow man. Again, what are you willing to sacrifice for that? What are you willing to sacrifice in the profit process? You see, you could fall prey to the attitude of the rulers of the Jews that's seen in John 12. Verse 42, Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Some people almost act as if they're ashamed to be a Christian, embarrassed if somebody finds out that they are, especially we look to our society where it's becoming more and more of a problem. But there's some people that still, they want to be liked by everyone. You ever heard the phrase, uh, especially I've heard it at funerals, oh, he didn't have an enemy. People mean that as a good statement. I think it's a sad statement. Because if you're going to stand for anything, you're going to make enemies. I realized that as a young preacher. And it's been that way throughout my experiences. People are going to get upset with you. People are going to get mad at you. People are going to get angry at you. And they become your enemies. Paul even asked the Corinthians, am I, Am I your enemy because I told you the truth? Well, for some people, that's the case. But we always need to remember that friendship with the world makes one an enemy of God. That's what James told us in James chapter 4, verse 4. The last one we'll look at is another one that I worked with the young people. Because as they were graduating from college, Many of them had found what they thought would be the perfect mate for them. And they were looking for the perfect spouse. But some use the wrong definition of perfect. The first thing one needs to know is, are you a Christian? And I mean that in every sense of the word. I don't mean it of somebody who just attends every Sunday morning. But I mean it one who lives their life as a Christian. That lives by the principles that are found in Scripture. That gives obedience to the Lord on a day-to-day -day basis. And that the Lord is first and foremost in their life. But it happens. Some go for what they desire. Oh, they think the perfect mate, young men who base their choice on physical appearance alone, I think will spend the rest of their lives with a person who cares more about their appearance than their character. And young women who are impressed by a fancy car some young man drives may spend the next 40 years complaining that he cares more about that car than he does about me. You see, be careful what you ask for. Be careful what you desire, because it may not turn out the way that you think that it will. As we bring our lesson to a close, again, be careful what you ask for and what you seek in life, because you just might get it. Because we are told that we are going to reap what we sow. And if you sow to the flesh of the flesh, you're going to reap corruption. I believe in this life and in the life to come. But if you sow to the spirit of the spirit, you'll reap life. So, are we seeking first the kingdom of God? Are we making all of our choices and basing all our desires once upon what God would have us to do and to be? That's important. I can't compete with this world because I'm in another race. I'm in the race that Paul was in, that he referred to in 1 Corinthians 9. 
I'm the race to heaven. And that's the race we all need to be in. David's going to lead us to number 348. If you need to be into that race or be restored to that race, give up your physical wants and desires, your lusts for things. You come to Jesus Christ, who grants you everything, spiritual blessings, peace, a joy that this world can't give you. If you need to come to him, let us know while we stand and while we sing.